Um, we are, like I said, we're, we're starting this series on family discipleship, and like I said, first part of that was, was talking about what, is it, what does it mean, what does it look like uh, to share our story, right? Share our story that's a big part of uh, family discipleship. Um, and as elders, we, um, we have been kind of talking about this idea of family discipleship uh, really since last year. It's been something that's been on our hearts. And so um, as we begin today, I want to start with, with, a, with the first question, just kind of why. why. Why family discipleship, right? Why do we need a series on family discipleship? And for some of you guys, uh, maybe like me, and, and it was kind of funny, we were uh, in our elders meeting talking about family discipleship, and, and one thing Sam pointed out was he said, this is what I feel like when I hear just family discipleship, right? How many of you guys like feel like it's just this moment, right, where I got to just like, you know, lift the child up and give them to God and stuff like that, right? And I thought, man, what a great, what a great picture. Um, that really brings me back to a moment um, in like 1996, right? Some of you guys are like, what is that? It's the Lion King and you're welcome. Um, and so, um, right, but that's, that's really not what discipleship is. That's really not what the goal of, of this is. Um, and the reason why Family discipleship is important is because our kids need it, and our future needs it. Our kids need it, and our future needs it. In fact, uh, we, are, we, are in, we are about to engage in a new generation. In fact, um, the new generation that um, started in 2010, so if you are a 2010, um, and it's going to go all the way to 2024, Right? So basically, just to put that in your mind, like from middle school to infants right now, uh, that's the new generation. And that name for that generation is Generation Alpha. Generation Alpha. They've already started to do some research on this generation um, and, and, and looking at that. And so they decided to, to label them Alpha. Um, and here's a few things that we know about Generation Alpha. Um, this is going to be the best educated, wealthiest, most health conscious generation that we've seen so far. In fact, some people are even labeling them the mini millennials because the world they're going to live in, it, by and large, is going to be one ran by the millennial generation. And so um, it's going to really affect a lot of um, what they're doing. And so uh, this will also be the first generation born uh, that is connected to a screen maybe more than they're connected to a person. So think about that for just a second. In fact, um, uh, an Australian researcher named McCriddle, um, who was actually the one who named them the Alpha Generation, says this. He says, This newest generation are part of an unintentional global experience where screens are placed in front of them from the youngest age as pacifiers, entertainment, entertainers, and educational aides. This great screen age in which we are all living has bigger impacts on the generation exposed to such screen saturation during their formative years, right? And so researchers are already starting to, to ponder what is the impact going to be on someone who was raised with a screen in front of their face from their earliest moments, right? And I'll just be honest. I'll be honest. Um, a lot of what the researchers are concluding is not really positive, right? They're, 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 they're having a lot of, of c conclusions um, about um, what's going to happen because of this and work ethic and things like that. However, right, um, and some have even concluded that this is going to be a hopeless generation. However, I believe that the Bible promises us that there is hope for all through the power of the gospel, right? That, that as Paul wrote to the church in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In the same way that the gospel transformed lives in Paul's day, I believe that it is the hope that will transform lives today. And so our culture and our world may look around and say, this generation that's coming up, there's not much hope for them. But I have a lot of hope in what God is going to be able to do through the power of the gospel. And essentially that is what discipleship is. It is a process of training and teaching and showing the gospel and how the gospel is lived out in their lives. And as a church, right, as a church, we feel a responsibility for every person who is a part of Bedrock. Whether they are uh, an adult, whether they are a teenager, whether they are an elementary kid, or whether they are an infant, 
we as elders of the church have a responsibility to invest in them, to invest in our families, to invest as a church community into the next generation. And so as, as elders, we decided that we wanted to make an investment in the families by doing the series this year, right? It's the reason that we decided that we wanted to have kids in our services, right? And that's a very intentional decision. It wasn't just for convenience, right? There were three reasons that we decided that we wanted kids to be a part of our Sunday morning time together. One was that they get to observe you practicing your faith as parents and as adults in this room, they get to watch you week in and week out as you worship God, as you gather together in fellowship, as you study the word together. They're observing that. They're bringing all of that into their lives. Secondly, that they get to participate in worship with us. Some of the sweetest moments are on a Sunday morning when I can look back and our, and our team is leading worship here and I can see the kids just like getting into the worship and they're just singing along. By the way, in a couple weeks, the kids are actually going to be leading us in worship. I'm super excited about that. But number three, and I think this is so important given the culture that we live in, is that our kids begin to normalize church community. That it becomes part of their life to understand that we come together as a community and that we fellowship and we study God's word together and we meet together and we're there for one another. And so as, as elders, we talked about how the most important thing that we can do is that we can invest in the members of our church to teach them and to train them how to invest in the next generation. And really, that's what Scripture tells us that our responsibility is, right? If you guys will remember back with me in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says this, and he gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers, right? All of these people he gave to the church. Why? so that they could equip the saints for the work of the ministry, right? Now, a lot of us think that that line should go something like he gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers so they could do the work of the ministry, right? But what he actually says is that, that our responsibility is to equip the body, right, the individual members of this church, so that you can go out and to do the work of ministry, that you can make disciples. Why? For the building up of the body until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To the measure of man, to mature manhood or womanhood, the maturity in Christ, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we no longer are to be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. You see, as the church, we are to equip everyone in the body to disciple so that our kids then may grow up to full maturity in Christ so that they can stand against all the waves and the wind that life is throwing at them. And that's not just a job for a few guys who get to speak on Sunday morning. That's a responsibility for the community, for the church, or as we said last week, the family, that it's all of our responsibility you see, we've, we've kind of sub-titled uh, this series, No Spiritual Orphans. And the reason for that is that we feel like a lot of times as churches, if we're not careful, we can do a really good job of, of kind of reaching some parents maybe uh, or really kind of structuring things for adults. But then we end up leaving all of these kids as spiritual orphans. They don't have a place or people that are investing in them. And so our responsibility as a church community is to come around the kids in the church, to come around the families in the church and to equip them and to encourage them and to, to guide them. And so we must start with a very simple question then. If, if we're going to disciple kids within the church, if we're going to call this family discipleship, right? Probably the most important question then is what is discipleship, right? It's a term that I think we throw around a lot in in churches, maybe it's a term too that, that, that when you hear discipleship, maybe you think about a class or something kind of structured. But what is discipleship? And in the New Testament, um, Jesus gives us probably the clearest definition of what discipleship is. He says this in Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. And Jesus came to them. So let me just kind of paint this picture real quickly just so you know where we are in the story. Jesus has, has died on the cross 
and he has risen again, and he's been spending 40 days going out, meeting with people, um, and, and, and appearing to people, uh, to his followers, right? And he's about to ascend back to the Father, right? And he's meeting with his disciples, and here's what he says. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Then he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, here's a really interesting thing about this passage. There is one verb in there that Jesus uses in verse 19. And it's actually the verb to make disciples, right? So, so everything else is just a description of what it means to make disciples. So first of all, we see that Jesus says to go, right? So there's this idea that as you are going about in your day-to-day life and the places that God is going to take you to and the relationships that he's going to take you in and bring you into, that you're making disciples. And as you are making those disciples, then you start to, to baptize. They're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as a testimony to what God has done in their lives. And as you were going and as they're being baptized, then you were to teach them all the things that Jesus had taught us. And then there's that beautiful reminder that in this process, that Jesus says that he's always with us, even to the end of the age. Okay? So what we want to do is we, we want to take a few more minutes together in our groups, and we want to talk about this word disciple. Right? And, and I want to encourage you guys, if you have kids in your group, um, we're, not doing, um, we're not doing kids' questions this time because we want to bring the kids into our discussion the best way that we can this morning, okay? And so we try to, to kind of structure these questions um, much like we would our kids' questions we do um, a lot of times in the back. And so kids, feel free for you guys to answer these questions in the group if you're comfortable, okay? Um, and, and we want to, to be able to share in this time together. So here's the question that we're going to talk about. When you hear the word disciple, uh, what do you think about when you hear the word disciple? Um, how does this word then relate to people who are Christians? Are, are they the same? Are they different? Um, what do you guys think about as those words relate? So um, let's just take a couple minutes together. Maybe a few people can answer in your group and talk about that. And then we'll come back together and we're going to dive more into this um, idea of discipleship. All right, you guys. Um, hopefully that you had a little discussion time there to talk about what does it mean to be a disciple um, and as we, as we look at this, right, really that word disciple that we're, that we're going to use over and over again really just means to be a follower, a learner, or maybe like an apprentice, right? So I think about, I think about like in Star Wars, right, how, how Luke was an apprentice to Yoda, right? Like he, he followed him around and he learned uh, the ways of the force by following him around, right? That's, that's really at the very core of this word, what Jesus means is to be a disciple, to be a follower, to be, a, to be an apprentice of someone. And so uh, a disciple is, a, is an apprentice. And so as we think about um, our responsibility um, to, to equip families within the church to be disciple makers, right? A disciple maker then is just someone who is making apprentices of Jesus, right? It's really simple. We're just, we're making apprentices of Jesus. And, and another place that this concept shows up, and this is really where we're going to be rooted at um, throughout this series, um, in the Old Testament is in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6 Verses 4 through 9, um, some people call the beginning of this, it's called the Shema. It was a, it was a prayer that was repeated over and over again um, by, by Jewish, um, by, by, by Israelites, by the Jews. And they would, they would say this in the morning, they would say it in the evening. Um, but really this passage is going to become our central text as we look at this idea of family discipleship and, and how do we disciple uh, children and the next generation. Um, and so I just want to read it for us this morning. Um, in the weeks following, we're actually going to read this together as a church community every week. Um, but I'm going to read it to you this morning. Um, and here's what it is. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And she'll talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and you shall, 
and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You see, there's this idea that what, what he's saying here, right, in this passage is that we are to love God essentially with all that we are. With all that we are. And that is essentially what discipleship is. You see, it's a, it's a process of loving God. We're teaching our kids how to love God with all that they are. As well as what Jesus said in Matthew 28 is that they will follow Jesus. They'll become followers of Jesus no matter where he leads them. And so this, this then leads to an important question then. Whose responsibility is discipleship? Is it a responsibility of the family? Or is it a responsibility of the church? Right? Well, in one sense, it is a responsibility of the family. God has given each family a responsibility to train their children to follow the Lord. Right? We see that each one of us has been given a responsibility to follow the Lord. Right? Parents, parents potentially um, are the most influential people in our children's lives, right? There's the potential as parents to be the most influential person in a child's life. And at the same time, God has also commanded us that we should, that we should teach our children to follow him and to know him. And in Deuteronomy 6, the beginning of, before we get to chapter, to verse 4, in chapter 1, in verse 1, right, as Moses is writing this to the people, right, and, and, and in this section, Moses is writing to show them what they need to be about as they get ready to go into the promised land. What, it, what are they to be as a kingdom that is following after God? What are they to be individually as families, and what are they to be as a, as a nation as they go into this promised land? And beginning in verse 1, here, notice what Moses says. Now this is the command, commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land in which you were going to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your sons and your sons' sons, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Notice that that what Moses says here, that I command you and your sons and your sons' sons. You see, Mo, there's this idea that there's a responsibility for parents to be teaching our children the commandments of the Lord. That's a responsibility that God puts on to parents. And so if you're a parent in the room this morning, that there is a distinct privilege and responsibility that God has given to you to teach your children about the Lord, to teach them the ways of the Lord, to show them what it looks like to follow the Lord in your life. Also think about this, parents. As parents, you guys are given 164 hours a week, if you, if you think about it. Whereas the church, like let's just say that you come to church on Sunday and you're a part of a life group, right? That's four hours a week, Right? Parents, you have 164 hours. I know it's a little bit less than that if your kids are in school, but there's 164 hours that you have available with your kids. And so there's a reason that the Bible puts an emphasis on our responsibility as parents to invest in our children. And there's this beautiful promise, right? Just as he promised the Israelites that your, that your days may be long, that, you're, that there may be a good life for you and your family as you invest in them. You're teaching them and making these eternal deposits in your family. And so the family has a responsibility. As parents, we have a responsibility to our children. But it's not just for the family. It's also for the church. God has also given the church the responsibility to train the children that fall under its care. Going on the next verse in Deuteronomy 6, verse 3, he says this, Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, all those commandments, that it may go well for you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord your God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Notice that not, he's only not just talking to the parents here, the family, but he's talking to all of Israel. He's talking to the entire community. And so there's a responsibility that as a church community that we have in the process of growing and discipling the children in our church. There's a responsibility that we have. And you see, this should be more the idea of a collaboration and not a competition. 
right? I think sometimes in churches we think that it's this competition, right? We got to have this so that the kids come here and here and here, right? But it's a collaboration as the family and the church partner together to invest in the next generation, right? The church then should be equipping parents to be the primary disciple makers in their kids' lives. And the church then should be encouraging the children to follow Jesus. And the family should be experiencing community together as they come together in the church. And so this process we're calling family discipleship. A partnership between a church community and a family coming together to invest in the children. It's a, it's a partnership that's going to take intentionality and consistency. You see, if we're not intentional, we're going to talk so much about the importance of intentionality over the next few weeks. But if we're not intentional with our time investing with our kids, then we can spend our time doing a whole lot of things, but really not making much of an impact. And then also consistency, that there's a process over time that we're training our children to become like Jesus and to follow after Jesus. And so just as Moses gave these instructions for God to Israel to, to invest, to teach the laws and commandments of God to their children and to the whole, commu- and the whole community had this responsibility, so we as the church want to join in this community. And so we have to be intentional and we have to be consistent. And so why? Why discipleship? Right? Why, why do we need to Invest in discipleship. I want to give you three reasons real quickly um, why this is important. Number one is because our kids are being discipled every day by someone or something, right? We think about the influences in our kids' life, the things they watch on TV, the friendships that they have, right? If If they're in school, right, the relationships and the teachers and those that are pouring into them. We think about um, everything else around them in the world. I mean, it's as simple as, as like going to the grocery store, right? And you're just influenced by all that you can see and take in and, and by all of that, right? And so our kids are being discipled every day by someone or something. And if we don't take an intentional investment into our children, then they are going to become like those outside influences, And so we need to be discipling our kids. Number two is because it is Jesus' plan to save the world, right? It's not by coincidence that that was the last words that we have recorded of Jesus to go and to make disciples because that was Jesus' plan for reaching the world. And number three, what's at stake? What's at stake, right? We have to realize that this is too important to miss. This is too important to miss, right? We don't want to look back on the lives of our kids and be able to say, man, I wish I would have invested more. As a church community, right? Maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you don't have kids. Or maybe your kids are already out of the house and grown, right? And you think, well, what does this have to do with me? It has a lot to do with you because as a church community, we all have a responsibility for the kids that are a part of our church. And, and so as a church, collectively, we don't want to miss the opportunity to invest in our children. We don't want to miss this opportunity to invest in the next generation. And so I want to, I want to kind of end with, with some encouragement, right? Because I know this can kind of seem overwhelming. As a parent, as a, as a member of the church, it's like, man, I don't know where to begin. This seems like a lot, and it is a lot, and there's a lot at stake. And so here's some encouragements for you. Uh, first, if, if you were someone and you're thinking, you know what, I don't have kids, or, or maybe my kids are not at home anymore, um, I want to encourage you, don't check out, right? Those of us who have kids in this church, we need you to invest in them and to model Christ for them. There are experiences that God has given to you. There is, there is, there is um, experiences that you've had with the Lord or that you've walked through in life, and we need you to invest that into our kids. Secondly, we need more people discipling our kids and telling them the same things that we as parents are telling them as well. We need as many of those voices that can point them to Jesus as we can get in their life, 
right? As a parent, we realize that, that we, we need, right? We, there, there's a point where our kids get to where it's like, you know what? Mom and dad's voice may not be the loudest voice in my life anymore. And we need other adults and other people in the church community to have a voice in our kids' life, to be an encouragement to them, to be pointing them to Jesus, and to be teaching them about the gospel. Now, this is not parenting. I do want to be clear. Discipleship is not parenting, okay? And so we're not asking that, that all of you have to come and parent our kids for us. That's not what we're saying at all, right? But by discipleship, we mean investing in them and inten- intentionally teaching them about Jesus. And so we need you. We, we need those who his kids have, have grown up and no longer at home. We need the singles in the church. We need the young adults in the church. We look, need those uh, young married without kids in the church. We need all of you to pour into our kids. Some of you may be thinking this morning, you know what, this sounds great, but it feels impossible. Right? And I just want to ask you to hope for just a minute. Hope that the power of the gospel could really transform your family. Hope that you could have that relationship with your kids that you've always hoped for. Right? And in the process, we want to address some practical steps to create and sustain discipleship in your families. Right? And so we want to create some intentional steps. And so where do we go from here? Well, over the next four weeks, we're going to look at four different avenues of discipleship or aspects of discipleship. The first is modeling, right? How do we model the gospel for our children, right? Week number two is all about making time, that idea of intentionality. How do we, how do we create and make time for that to happen? Number three are moments. How do we take everyday moments and turn them into gospel conversations with our kids? And then number four is milestones. What are those milestones in the lives of children that we need to celebrate as a community, that we need to be intentional and create in the lives of kids within our church? And so really what we want to do is we want to create a culture of family discipleship, right? And so for just a minute as you're sitting there, I want you to think about what, what do you want your family to look like? What do you want families in the church to look like? How do you think this will happen? What effort would that take on your part in order to make this vision a reality? What conversations, what priorities need to change in your life so that you can invest in the next generation? What are things that you're already doing well that you can encourage someone else in? And I want us to begin to create this picture of discipleship. And here's the truth, right? This is the hope we have for our kids. Now, it may feel like I've said this a hundred times this morning, right? But this is the hope that we have for our kids, for the next generation, for, for, for Generation Alpha, as we talked about, the hope of the gospel, the hope that God, through the power of Christ, will transform the lives of the next generation. And so with this, each week, we also want to bring some people in to share from their perspective and their experience on what they have learned in, uh, in, in relation to discipleship.